Hey, Slick Talkers, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast, and I know that if you love this show, you'll also love my morning show called Good Morning Hospitality with my co-hosts Michael Golden and Brandy Canale as we spend 30 minutes every Monday morning to dive into the industry's top latest news and trending topics. So go check it out on wherever you find your podcasts at Good Morning Hospitality, and you can live stream with us on Monday mornings on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, YouTube. Now, I hope you enjoy this episode. Great branding comes from great understanding. And it's like, Mm. it really is a matter of just knowing who you're talking to and how they talk to each other, how, what they care about, you know, like just like really a deep empathy for that audience and that guest experience and letting someone feel seen and heard before they've ever ever even stepped foot on the property or, or held the beer can in their hand or anything. Um, all mm-hmm. of a sudden, you're kind of speaking to them as, as though you're in their circle. You're like you're part of their community. Welcome to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast where we discuss all things hospitality, hotels, and business. You can find us online at slicktalkthepodcast.com and on every podcast listening platform. What is up, all my Slick Talkers? Thank you guys so much for being patient as episodes are a little bit slower coming out. Um, I have had a little bit of downtime, now about to head out to another COVID testing site for the Army National Guard. But prior to that, um, I got to sit down with the co-founders of OMFG Co. out in Portland, Oregon, and we had an amazing discussion involving branding and, of course, the uniqueness of the guest experience that you can create as a hotelier or anybody involving hospitality. So stay tuned for more to come out on the show, and thank you guys for tuning in. Now back to the episode. He's kind of like the Joe Rogan of the hospitality industry right now. All right. Welcome back to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Will Slickers. And today, I feel a little bit bad that I say this about all my episodes, but today's a real special episode just because I've bonded with these guys from OMFG Co. And we are creating a cool episode talking about branding the issues with branding in the hospitality space, the amazing things of branding and hospitality space, as well as business and just in today's world with COVID-19, you know, running rampant in our country with, you know, travel bans and, you know, counties shut down and states shut down. Um, And so this is really an exciting episode just because I think both myself and the gentleman with me, Jeremy and Fritz, have a lot of passion about what we do and in regards to the industry. So I'm excited to introduce them, bring them on the show. Jeremy, Fritz, thank you guys so much for being on and how are we doing today? Yeah, thanks for having us. Doing great, yeah, thanks for having us, we're excited. Awesome, well, thank you guys again. And so let's kind of, you know, introduce each other, uh, who you are, how you got started, what's your origin? Uh, As I like to say, the origin stories are, you know, usually the biggest key factor of the episode that lead to where you guys are today. And then we'll talk about OMFG Co. and what that means and what you guys do. Cool. Um, I'll go first. I'm Jeremy Pelly. Um, I'm one of the co-founders uh, alongside Fritz uh, of OMFG Co. Uh, we're about 11 years into running our studio. And um, I got my uh, kind of break into the, the design world in general through um, uh, an experimental ad school at Wyden and Kennedy an ad agency here in Portland. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the, I think the only independent globally owned or global advertising agency in the world. So they were doing this experimental little ad school that lasted about a year and I got into that program. So it was kind of like the perfect scam, like where like I paid money to be there, like a school, but like I got to work on, you know, real work <laughs> as opposed to student work. So it works out for everybody. Um, but it wasn't work where it was like, uh, Coca-Cola or Starbucks or Nike. It was, it was nonprofit work and it was for the community and things like that. So it was really actually a really cool program. And I was in the building, you know, meeting all these really world-class level creatives and, and getting exposed to the design world for the first time ever. Um, and uh, because my background was anthropology, I studied anthropology in school. Okay. And so basically I went to that program, did not get hired at Wyden. I did get hired at uh, an up and coming hotel that existed only in Seattle at this time. This is around um, 2000 and six, um, I got hired at a, a hotel called Ace. And, you know, they're well known now, um, but uh, mm-hmm. they weren't well known then. I had never heard of them and uh, they were looking for an art director. So I got lucky. I, I landed that position and, and that's what kind of got me into the hotel and hospitality world in general. Um, I worked with those guys for about four plus years uh, before I started getting kind of an itchy 
itchy finger to like kind of stretch my, you know, stretch my wings and explore new things. Yeah. And, and uh, around that time, um, you know, I had met Fritz back at uh, Wyden. Uh, he was working there when I was in the school and um, basically got a chance to uh, take on a co-freelance uh, job together uh, for a local charcuterie uh, called Olympic Provisions, now called Olympia Provisions. Okay. Um, and that was our kind of first excuse to be able to finally work together. And, uh, you know, it was a lot, it was so much fun that within a week we were just like, screw it, we should just start a company. And, uh, you know, we ended up forming OMF Gico together and we've been at it ever since. But I'll hand the mic over to Fritz. Yeah, I, uh, let's see, I came into this, uh, I got a second degree in uh, graphic design, uh, kind of a couple of years after graduating the first time. And uh, from there, worked in a number of design shops around Portland. Uh, and then uh, one of my professors from from uh, PSU r reached out or t and just said, hey, we're hiring, you know, like if you have a portfolio, submit it. So I got a job at Wyden and that's kind of where I met Jeremy. I, was, I think it was his like last month mm -hmm. uh, in 12 when yeah. I came in and we, they were doing this crazy boxing event and I signed up for it because somebody else dropped out. So we had some interaction through that, which is a really weird, funny experience. <laughs> Amateur awesome. boxing association sanctioned bout uh, yeah. and the only one I've ever done, but it was uh, a lot of fun, really crazy event. But anyway, that's how we first met. And then we like just stayed in contact and saw each other around and, you know, Ace is not that far from Wyden. So I'd see Jeremy when I went over to get coffee or anything like that. So we just kind of stayed in touch. Uh, while I was at Wyden, I started doing lots of freelance projects on the side and I worked with Stumptown Coffee on a bunch of things. Uh, I don't know, maybe more notably like their packaging that had the little card inside the bag that you could remove, uh, worked with them to develop that and then worked on a bunch of other brand uh, stuff, collateral pieces, signage, all sorts of things. So like with Ace and Stumptown having a ton of overlap, we ended up just interacting with each other here and there and then, you know, had uh, a number of other projects like that that were just really close together, but not quite. Uh, so when we landed that first job, we were like, oh, cool. Yeah. What, what if we just did this together? You know, we kind of pitched it together uh, to these clients that we both knew many of. Mm -hmm. uh, so they said yes. And we, uh, you know, really just enjoyed working together and had like this, every project just instantly felt like it grew better, quicker, uh, you know, versus kind of working on your own in a vacuum, you sit there and weigh the options and you go like, oh, I don't know, this one's good and this one's good too. <laughs> uh, but it's just so nice to have that other voice to bounce things off of and an uh, opinion on things. And uh, we just found that like the energy there was so uh, exciting. Mm -hmm. So that led to us, you know, starting a company and yeah, I don't know if we, we want us to talk talk a little bit more about that. We uh, sat sat down at Jeremy's dining room table at the time. We both had laptops and decided we'd start a business. We kind of had no idea what that entailed other than, you know, like we should make it legitimate enough that we can, you know, accept checks and <laughs> other things like that. We had a friend who's a lawyer who helped us set up our all of our stuff. But first we had to fit, pick a name. So we were, you know, at the time obsessed with uh, just like, the little plaques on the back of chairs and all these like cool pieces of machinery and like all that, that era, uh, probably like 1950s era of building things, forties too, probably, but even like those big steel case desks and other things like that all had these plaques and a lot yeah. of them were manufacturing companies or uh, had these kind of generic, but strong sounding names. So we just went down a path of trying to find, find one of those that was available. Uh, and that was just like basically URL searching. Uh, and, you know, we eventually landed on official manufacturing company, uh, which was super generic and didn't say Portland design company or branding company or anything like that. Cause we wanted to be able to take on anything. Um, and, you know, from there we started buying URLs and bought official MFG co after official manufacturing company. And then we bought OMFG co and we just sat there and laughed for a minute and we're like, oh, that's really funny, you know, and kind of moved on from it and kept it, but uh, used it like just as some of our logos. Uh, I think we made like 17 logos the next day. <laughs> and then, you know, just like we're just kind of cranking stuff out and having a good time doing it. Uh, and then, you know, eventually uh, official manufacturing companies kind of gone by the wayside and uh, everyone knows us as o OMFG Co. Mm -hmm. Most of our bigger clients just call us OMFG 
half the time. Uh, and a lot of people call it OGMF Co or OMGF Co. It's just fascinating uh, how funny it is, but it still seems to work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to say, uh, when I was talking to one of my mentors and I told you guys the story, but I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to do a pre-interview with the uh, OMFG Co. in Portland. And he was like, oh, I know what OMFG stands for. And I was like, it's not that actually. <laughs> and I told him it was an official manufacturing company. He was like, oh, that's unique. That's clever branding. And I was like, well, they are a branding company. So, you know, they did their job right. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, we... Uh accept the uh, misunderstanding uh, willingly or gladly. Right. Yeah, we know our name is borderline unpronounceable if you've never <laughs> tried to say it before. Like OMFG Co is not a pronounceable word. So it's, uh, it's, it's fun to play with and uh, we like the fluidity that comes with it. And good conversation starter, I think. You know, mm -hmm. people, OMFG Co, what does that stand for? And then of mm -hmm. course, it gets the juices flowing. So yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Well, uh, I definitely think you know, like we uh, we talked about just some unique unique stuff, and what I've really been passionate about this whole conversation with you guys is that um, you guys both have a, a deep desire for what you do, and uh, and it shows obviously in your guys' startup. Um, and I think it's funny how you guys like couldn't avoid each other in the earlier like days. Like your paths always crossed, so it was just like it was just bound to happen, which is usually a good a good sign. Um, Great story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, we found out how you guys got into the hospitality space. Um, Jeremy, you know, having the connections with Ace, which mm -hmm. uh, a lot of listeners obviously probably know Ace for who they are today. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, you know, have someone on the show that was part of the, you know, uh, you know, original startup of that is, is pretty incredible. I think, um, you know, again, at the end of the day, it's, it's just cool to to see where that started. Um, so we know how you guys got in the hospitality space, um, but the biggest thing I know from my experience in the industry is that hoteliers alike are very stubborn most of the time or very picky and sometimes both. Uh, obviously, I think you, if you're, you're stubborn, you're pretty picky. If you're picky, you're stubborn. Um, so how did you guys convince, not just, you know, not convince, I would say, but how did from going from ACE to getting other hotel you know, companies in order to get you guys as their, their interior design. Cause you guys also, I think it also helped the audience explain what you guys do, not just by branding, but you also have an interior team as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can, I can start with that one and I'll hand you the mic Fritz. Um, but in a nutshell, I mean, around the time we started our company, no one had yet taken like online credit in a big way for the great design, the world-class and influential design of Stumptown or of Ace at that point. And I'm not trying to toot our own horns. It's just people really liked both of those companies. People really responded well to both Stumptown and Ace and no one was, you know, really um, taking credit for being the designers behind it. So when we put our site up, we were like instantly internet famous, but completely, yeah. completely broke, you know, like, you know, hundred percent broke. And, um, and so we, you know, I think just the fact that Ace was so desirable and Stumptown were so desirable in their respective industries, uh, we started getting interests by a lot of different companies. And, and then we too started, because of this, these doors opening uh, via email and via, you know, like interviews on cool hunting or whatever, we started like also putting together little packages um, and sending it out to people like Marriott and like the bigger, the bigger, the bigger guys, just like, you know, we, we, we had one idea where we were like, um, let's just buy a bunch of vintage tools from like Goodwill and places like that. And then paint on the tool, like say it was like a ball peen hammer or like a handsaw or something we'd paint, let's work together in like a hand done like design that like kind of made the piece, like the tool look like a little piece of art. And then we put that in a, in a box with a little card that says, looking forward to hearing you. And it was like, that was it really simple. Just like a gift to people. And it, you know, we heard back from some people, but not from everyone. And we didn't, yeah. we didn't think it went, went anywhere, but all of a sudden we found ourselves on the short list of approved design agencies that could work with autograph collection on the West coast. Yeah. So that opened the doors right away to us, like getting business with, you know, the autograph collection, which is, you know, we've done several of those hotels at this point. And, and just kind of naturally through the relationships of that world, we just kind of kept, you know, meeting more and more of the right people. And so it's kind of rolled from there, but I'll, I'd love to hear what Fritz has to say. Yeah. I was going to say even like further back from that, um, you know, like we started as a branding 
studio for the most part. You know, we took on lots of weird projects. We were making like lip bulb signs for places uh, to the point where like we later were like, oh man, we never should have done that because there's so many lip bulb signs everywhere. Like everybody's now saying something in bulbs. Uh, and like, we can't take full credit for it, but we definitely like had an influence on that, especially in Portland. And in Portland, you know, came up at the same time as a huge F&B city and a uh, hospitality city, I guess, in general, with like all these hotels and restaurants and bars all kind of like gaining notoriety at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, like we were able to work on a bunch of those projects that then were seen by everyone and everyone uh, was kind of paying attention to. So I think we came up with Portland uh, and then we started with branding and then later worked ourselves into interior design, just kind of uh, out of sheer will, I guess, because we wanted to, uh, we, we just kept seeing all these opportunities where we could like, you know, weave the brand in, in, in all these more subtle ways uh, if we were more involved uh, in the interior design process. And then, and that kind of fell into our laps uh, way later on with a project uh, where we, you know, started by coming in, uh, they were, they were looking to get autograph status and we were one of the preferred vendors and uh, Marriott, recommended us we had a meeting with these guys and went out and looked at the property and did kind of a quick audit and like some brand concepts and by the time we got through brand concept they were saying like well what do you think about the interior package we have so far and we were like well if you like this brand concept you should probably redo it <laughs> and you know and they said yeah i think you're right um you know but then the interior design company who'd worked on it already for i don't know probably quite a while uh, I think had a number of other projects lined up and they were just like, we can't keep going on this. You know, we're kind of full and probably also somewhat burnt out. And uh, that's when they asked us to do the interiors on it. And, and up to that point, you know, we'd done restaurant, a few restaurants and a few kind of things where we, you know, first, first we did Spirit of 77, which is a bar here in town, a, a sports bar where we were like designing and building pretty much everything in it. And then from there we were like, not cost effective for us to build everything in it uh, it's not where we uh shine so uh from there we like did a space where we just designed it and had someone else build it and started to have some success with that where you're like okay man this is really great when we uh you know do what we're good at and uh pass the other stuff on to people who are good at that mm -hmm. um so eventually we worked our way into into this opportunity to do a hotel and at that point we had like one one other guy on staff full time who was you know helping us bring up our environmental program at the time, you know, which we now is a pretty, now is a full-fledged interior design uh, part of our business, you know, but at the time it was just like a couple of guys that knew how to do it. And, uh, you know, we, from there started asking more people and brought in other people and, you know, got surrounded ourselves with as many people as we could who had been there or had uh, been in, at least part of there uh and uh you know kind of grew it from there and that was like the Layla was the first project we did full interior design and branding for it was just kind of a massive undertaking uh because we started the interior design when demolition started and it was just like kind of a crazy uh yeah. always behind type of scenario but but oh yeah last thing okay. you also you also you know asked about just stubborn hoteliers or or owners you know and and we've definitely, you know, like, I think found, found that with a lot of the projects we work on, just that people are passionate about what they're doing and they care so deeply. And a lot of times it's their baby uh, that we're trying to help them with, uh, you know, which is a, you know, always a kind of delicate line to walk. And, you know, so we started early on by just really trying to get clear with the language that we put around every project and making it really clear, concise language that everyone could understand. And we, you know, before we start showing images, we'd get everyone to agree on the words. Uh, you know, just something that we could hold it up against. It wasn't necessarily our opinions, but more about what was right for the context. Uh, and then like from there, you know, we've just uh, built that into a lot, a lot more of like foundational work, strategy work that leads up to uh, the rest of the stuff. You know, uh, we, we always say it's easy to make things pretty, but it's hard to make them matter. And, you know, I think the the meaning part of it has always been what's drawn us to design and like to having stuff that goes a little bit deeper and uh, maybe sticks with you a little bit longer. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, what I love about hearing like your guys's combined experience together on, on OMFG is that is the development, like, okay, a couple of guys, you know, knowing we can do this, this and this, and then you get wrapped into interior design, but then figuring out, manufacturing and creating everything internally is not the best. So you take that away and then start building. It's just a natural development. 
And uh, for any of the listeners on the show know that like, if they've been a listener for a while, like in the beginning of when I started Slick Talk, is I've always wanted to get interior design uh, team on the show. And you're the first ones to do it. And so like to hear these, you know, certain aspects is pretty unique, especially when it comes to you're dealing with, you know, owner's babies and the, the overall massive like passion behind the projects. Um, it's pretty incredible. And so I, I love hearing all this type of stuff. Um, so did you, this is kind of just off, uh, off the cuffs, but with, you know, taking those roles on and taking on that position, did you see, like you just said, you know, it's, it's and it's hard to make things matter. Do you see that being the biggest struggle point for these kind of projects is like getting the, the passion and everything that matters to the owner and to the team to come out and flourish and, and then the creating of the prettiness and the, the look, you know, fell pretty, pretty quickly after that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, usually uh, a lot of what we do in the up, upfront process, like the audit and discovery or like positioning uh, piece of things where like, just looking at the market and looking at what is there, what's not there, looking at like, uh, you know, who might be coming to visit this place or who, who we might want to try to get to come visit this place. And, uh, you know, a lot of those things seem like they're, I don't know, maybe not obvious, but, but uh, as, as you dig into it and get to know it more, uh, it becomes more clear, you know? So it's like, I feel like a lot of times we go through this audit process and, our clients usually like, yep, yep, that's it. That's it. You know, and we're, but for us, that's so important to understand, you know, like we need to know like what, what the stakes are and what the context is in order to make any good decision. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I think getting through that process and going through that process with, with a client always helps just to like prove that we can, we understand what, where they're at and what they're dealing with. And also, you know, sometimes we point out the obvious, uh, but it's maybe the stuff that, uh, you know, a lot of times people that are working within it are too close to, to see, uh, you know, cause it's like, uh, I think we champion ourselves as outsiders and want to be, uh, bring that outside perspective. Cause it is worth a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I agree. And, and you know, what case in point I think is, uh, you know, the Lalo uh, project that you were just chatting about Fritz. Uh, you know, I feel like, for example, like the interior design team that was working on that one before um, we were hired to come up with the concept, because we were originally hired for that job just to do branding. It was like a, a traditional, just straight ahead branding job. And, and you know, we named it, we branded it, did all the things, and, and the client loved it. And we loved it because we did our research on the building. We did our research on mid-century modern Hawaiian aesthetics. We did our research on like all the stuff. So what they loved was that it meant something. They loved that it had a story. And, and so while the interior design team, it's like you know, reason why. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, the, the interior design team this whole time, they were just solving kind of for ho Hawaiian tropes. Like they, there were like broken surfboards as like an art piece and like all sorts of stuff. And, you know, I, I'm not trying to knock them at all because they're very talented and they're very sweet people, but there wasn't a reason why behind any of it. And, and if anything, it was made even more obvious uh, that surfboards weren't a good fit because this hotel was not a surf hotel. It was two blocks yeah. away from the beach. So yeah. we were just like, let's just do stuff that makes sense for this two, two block away from the beach location and not compete and not pretend we're something we're not. And so that's what we came up with. And that's what we came, we came through with Hawaiian graphics, um, you know, all the way through and a Hawaiian, um, you know, mid-century modern kind of tropes woven together, but they were all fresh takes of it. And what I love about that, and I've, I think you guys might understand the point I'm about to make with a company that you probably know out in Cannon Beach, Public Coast Brewery. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so what I love about what you just shared is that it tells a story, right? It gives an experience. It gives, you know, some, some feeling to when you walk into the place. And to me, that's all about the guest experience, right? We talk about so much, you know, we can talk about branding and all these certain things that we talk about as, you know, people in the industry. But the, bi the biggest point to get out from that is the guest experience and be able to tell a story. And I think that one company that really, for me, has shown that and. I just, I love the owner. I love the, the business and self, um, but you know, public coast brewing company, they, you know, they tell a story, you know, 1970 or I think it was 1993, you know, the coast became public all 363 miles of it. Um, that's why, you know, they named or no 1967 after their gold beer, uh, you know, the 67 uh, blonde ale, you know, they tell a story through all their products and 
And for me, that is such a cool thing because when your guest is on property, um, whether they're staying at one of the affiliate hotels or at the brewery itself, as a waiter, as a front desk person, you're able to give that experience and share that connection with them. Because now when they come back, the guest is going to re remember you taking the time to explain something that meant something to what you guys are doing as a team, as a mission. And I, I love that you just shared that because that, that's like the biggest point. And I will always like preach the guest experience and telling a story uh, on the podcast. And I think what you just shared right there is, is a perfect example. Well, yeah, I, I appreciate think it. Oh, go ahead. It comes down, yeah, it comes down to like, I don't know, like the, I think the just general stories are like the general Hawaiian story isn't really as much yours to share. And once you make it a little bit more unique or but unique to your situation, then it becomes more your story to own, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe the differentiator with, with, with that one and with like the Lalo where we had a lot of success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, we have a lot of, we have a lot of fun little mantras that we've um, kind of penned over the past 11 years. And, and another one beyond it's easy to make it pretty. It's hard to make it matter. That's one. But another one that comes to mind in this scenario is that um, it's something Fritz alluded to earlier is that great branding comes from great understanding. And it's like, mm. it really is a matter of just knowing who you're talking to and how they talk to each other, how, what they care about, you know, like just like really a deep empathy for that audience and that guest experience and letting someone feel seen and heard before they've ever, ever yeah. even stepped foot on the property or, or held the beer can in their hand or anything. Um, all of a sudden you're kind of speaking to them as, as though you're in their circle. You're like, you're part of their community. Yeah. Well, I think like exactly. that powerful feeling uh, in hospitality, like a, the, I think of being recognized where people talk about that, even if you don't know the person, but giving them that, you know, I've heard amazing stories uh, from restaurants or other places where, you know, someone walks in and they like know who you are and say, you know, Mr. Mm -hmm. Slickers, uh, we, we're so glad you're finally here. You know, like we've been expecting you, whatever that is, it just makes you feel good. You know, like that someone cares that you're there. Uh, yeah. And, you know, you can do that in a lot of ways, whether it's, you know, through an operational piece or through uh, even an art piece, uh, just something that, you know, meets you where you're at and mm -hmm. recognizes you there. No, that's what I loved about working at an autograph collection. That was my first experience in the hotel world. And so, um, you know, I have my guests that I talk to still to this day, like it's been five years and I'm still friends with them. Like we'll text each other and be like, Hey, Mrs. Malone, how you doing? Or like, you know, Mr. Chardin, my man, like where you've been, I haven't seen you forever. You know, those are such cool stories to have. And I love to be able to share that. Cause it's like, you know, still being able to talk about them and be like, Hey, like we, when we see each other, they're like your friends that you had in like elementary school that you never skipped a beat. You know, you haven't right. seen each other in 10 years, but mm -hmm. you guys pick up, pick up right where you left off. It's, yep. it's cool. It's a cool experience. And it's a cool, cool feeling. Um, but I want to kind of get into a, sh a little bit of a shift here in the conversation. Yeah. And this is what excited me when you and I, uh, when we all three talked prior to the recording date. And so let's talk about brand and like what that means. Cause I think especially in today's world with COVID and, you know, all this stuff, you know, a lot of stuff is shut down, but, you know, taking the time to focus on brand, focusing on the story, focusing on the experience, focusing on the look, all these types of things, brand, the word itself, I feel like has gotten diluted uh, in, a, in a few ways, just because, you know, it's something that's super important, but I think, you know, we haven't, a lot of places, unlike you guys, which I totally just give you a round of applause for your company and how you are able to, you know, make the the word brand mean something. Um, but what are the key fundamentals that have been proven through your business and through your clients? This is kind of a multi-part question, by the way. So uh, what are the key fundamentals that have proven through your business and your clients? How can these fundamentals be applied to today's world? Mm -hmm. So, and we'll get a little bit into this. So, you know, we talked about the OTAs and how branding and all the other stuff, but I think right now, this is something that the audience can take away and immediately after listening, apply right to their direct business. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I want to get your guys insight on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, some thoughts I could share right away that come to mind are, you know, a, a brand is an experience, you know, like we were talking earlier about your, the brewery and, and, you know, it, this applies to basically every industry is, you know, like when someone rents a hotel room at like a, a sweet hotel, like a, you know, Hoxton or Ace or Wythe or something, they're not renting the room. They're renting the ability to tell their friends. I stayed at the Wythe when I went to New York. Like yeah. that's what they're, that's what they're paying for. You know, it's yeah. like this, this proof that they are living the life that, you know, is their dream life. And like they're, they're you know, people that they align with are the are people that hang out at the Wythe and that's who they, that's who they are too. And so, 
you know, I think that, you know, if, once you realize that a brand is not a logo, a brand's not a color palette, it's not a typeface, it's not any of that stuff, it's how it feels, you know, focusing on the feeling is one of our, our favorite things to do um, in general. That's amazing. Um, yeah. That's what I describe it. And then, and I think, uh, as a good okay. advice for anyone right now, uh, you know, like, we've, we've talked about this a lot internally is like, what can we do? You know, uh, and, and, and in general, it's a really hard question to answer. Uh, you know, I feel like it's always very much, uh, based on the context and the very specific instance and your brand in, in your city, uh, in your location, neighborhood, whatever, uh, seems like that's like where you need to start is just like, well, what, do, what do we normally, uh, Want to, how do we normally want to be perceived and now how does that change and how can we still bring some of that same uh, experience or feeling to the customer or to our audience? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, because something I didn't mention is that, you know, how I think we really towed our way into the uh, interiors world, because we are a branding studio first and foremost, um, is that we realized along the way that every decision is a brand decision, like everything, mm -hmm. like literally the the people you hire, how they talk, what they wear, um, you know, your color choices, like the music that's playing over the speakers, or if there's no music at all, uh, mm -hmm. if you tweet or if you don't, uh, if you have this custom scent or if you don't, these are all brand decisions, you know, and none of them are bad. The only way you can go wrong is being untrue to yourself, to your own values. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's where people don't spend time enough getting clear on what matters most to them, what matters most to this brand and this audience. And, um, and when you get clear on that, all of a sudden these aesthetic decisions that seem really willy nilly are very clear. They're very easy to like, be like, Oh, that, that feels off brand and this feels on brand, you know, like, so, you know, remembering and, and practicing saying to yourself that every decision is a brand decision and, and looking at it through a brand lens really helps you make more cohesive decisions. Yeah. I think even for us as a branding studio, uh, branding focused studio, you know, we started there and uh, definitely like, have the most experience in that space. Uh, we went through an exercise three and a half, four years ago where we established like all of our own core values and all of our, like our reason to exist and all these things that we'd never really done for ourselves. Cause I don't know, we weren't as worried about, about that for us, but the way we've found that that has impacted our business in a positive way since we've done it has been just spectacular. Like the hiring process, all of these things we know, if we hire people who align with our core values, we're going to, we're not going to have problems down the line where we just don't see eye to eye, you know, and it's just like, uh, been a game changer for us, you know, and I think that's the part that's, uh, I don't know. It's so funny how we never really, uh, had focused on our own business that way, just because, I mean, that's kind of what we did was mm -hmm. that for everyone else, right? Uh, kind of the cobbler's kids have no shoes type of thing or something. I don't know. Uh, but uh, it was just such a positive exercise for us. You know, like we landed on, like we, we exist to find a better way, you know, because it applies to pretty much everything we go into is we're always like kind of relentlessly reinventing our own business and the way we do things and our process and all these things just to try to make them better because why wouldn't we? Uh, yeah. You know, and, and uh, I think, you know, sometimes that can be challenging because there is a lot of change, but uh, you know, that's, I think that's the fun of it for us too, is just to, Kind of relentlessly improve uh on what we're doing and mm -hmm. and it's like always applies to a, any project that comes our way do you guys think that that is the way to bridge the gap between your brand and what you do you know is by providing the core values and really truly being like true to yourself as a team as a company as a founder whatever it may be um by establishing that sense your why your mission statement your core values what you believe in do you think that's a, the the gap you know bridge for um communicating a proper brand and, and doing you know the things that we do yeah and i think that's like the 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 piece of it too that's like if the difference between the aspirational core values maybe your aspirational values and your actual core values uh, are kind of like if you look at a business you've already established, they're like, what are the things that are inherently true with every like big decision we've made or the reason we started this thing or why we get up out of bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. And those are, you know, those are your core values and your aspirational values could always be like those things you really want to do, but maybe not quite not, you maybe haven't quite achieved yet, you know? So it's mm -hmm. like, 
uh, I think the, the delineation between those is really important. But once you have that right, I mean, that's what, that is like honesty, you mm-hmm. know, in a in a big way, you know. And it's like that idea of authenticity, which we've all heard too much of in the last uh, several years. Just like we've heard too much of brand and mm-hmm. personal brand, and you know, all of these. Yeah, disrupt <laughs> disrupting your authentic <laughs> brand. Self. Uh, I, I mean, I think like all of those buzzwords kind of start to lose meaning in a way, uh, just because they get overused. But really, like uh, the authentic part is just yeah, being true to to yourself and to your business and to the reason that it you know exists. Okay, so the question I really want to ask, and I think you know, from a perspective, because you're not just a branding and interior design company that doesn't understand the industry. You guys do understand the phrases and the terminology and like the actual purpose of what we do in the industry as hoteliers and hoteliers and all this other stuff, you know, restaurateurs. Um, So my thing is, do you think that we have ruined the word brand or branding in hospitality by creating so many soft brands, whether it's, you know, a bunch of little things under one big chain, such as Marriott or Hilton, you know, how they have all these autograph collections and, and, and Courtyard Inn or whatever. And so we have all these soft brands and my, I guess, point two five version of the question would be with all the OTAs in place, the biggest thing that we got at front desk um, from being a front desk, you know, person all the way to managing and directing is that, you know, guests think so often that they booked directly on our site. But yet when we checked the reservation, they went through an OTA, which OTAs are getting clever. You know, they're getting, they're looking more, you know, authentic of that individual hotel, whether it's an independent property or branded property. I think this is a a multiple question question, but um, I want your guys insights on, on the branding of, you know, hotels and hospitality when it comes to soft brands. And then of course, OTAs, and their development of branding to more shift towards that booking instead of a direct booking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the the usage of the term brand in hospitality is weird for us just because like that's kind of what we live in. And, and in hospitality, uh, brand typically means uh, like a big com- com- big uh, hotel chain. Like, are, mm-hmm. is it is it gonna be branded? And then, oh, yeah. or is it a soft brand where it's through one of those brands, but the brand isn't as overt, uh, you know, and then I think there's some very, very soft brands. I don't know what the ultra soft brands uh, are the ones where you like, don't find out that it's part of a brand until you like, open up something uh, at check in that says like, hey, this is or there's a sign behind the front desk, you know, and you're like, what? Yeah, how did they get yeah. away with that? Uh, so, I mean, like that, the way the terms used is much different. You know, I think ID is used the same way in hospitality where ID is interior design, but like for us, it was brand identity was ID. And then like, as we got into interior design and more hospitality conversations, every time ID is used, it's for uh, interior design. So, I mean, I think it's like kind of that in industry speak or lingo, you know, that makes sense within the context. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend but, to think, but it's kind of a strange, strange way to unpack it, you know, like, we want you to make a brand for a non-branded hotel <laughs> or right. it's not a branded hotel, but, but make a brand. Yeah. 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 I feel like it's not, it's for me, it's less about the word brand than it is more about like the word, like independent, you know, like the, it's like, I think the word independent has been, con- has been made confused in the hotel world for sure. Simply because of things like autograph collection where they're technically independent, but they're also not. And so you, you know, like you don't really, you don't really like to Fritz's point, you don't really know what you're getting until you're there sometimes. And it's, a, yeah. it's a, like an unpleasant surprise. I think that people, I feel like there's an, uh, an unintentional feeling of being duped a little bit whenever you like book something you think is independent and ultimately is part of Kempton or, or, or Starwood or something huge, you know, and it's like, you know, no hate on any of the big guys, but, but it's yeah. like, you know, whenever, whenever they, uh, you know, act as chameleons with uh, the, the true independent hotels out there, it's, uh, it can be misleading, but I think brand is just a simple uh, ubiquitous term for so many things. And so in that way, I don't know if it's overused or ruined or anything, but I think that because it's, it wasn't, it's not necessarily clear to begin with, but I think independent was clear at one point and now it's not so yeah. clear anymore. It's just like boutique was clear at one point. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, like every, mm-hmm. and everything, uh, I think as a lot of the bigger brands got into trying to compete with boutique and trying to compete with 
uh, short-term rentals and all these other things, uh, mm -hmm. it has made it really squishy or a little bit more confusing. And I think intentionally so yeah. uh, for sure, you know, which I think is a good, good lead into the OTAs, which I also think no one really even knows they're participating in that game uh, until they uh, get there and find that out, you know, same thing, or you yeah. have to like, oh, actually, yeah, I have to look up my Expedia number to find out yeah. what, how I actually booked this room. Right. Uh, I mean, I think that's funny. We we were talking with our CFO about it, who's a partner, our partner as well. And he was just talking about like that, just that kind of SEO game involved in that, yeah. that everybody's like trying to spend just enough that they make it to the top, but they can still make their margin based on the yeah. money they get for, from the booking. And it's just like a weird, it's just a weird, uh, a weird game that I think, you know, like we would prefer not to play or not to have to play. You know, we're always talking about trying to make a destination that, that mm -hmm. people will choose uh, when we, you know, when we, when we can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we'll choose because they want to stay there, not because it's the cheapest location or maybe the per perfect look, perfect location closest to the airport or whatever kind of thing, you know, like uh, we're usually trying to compete more on the, just the experience someone wants to have. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Jay, I don't, you had some thoughts on OTA, I think. Yeah, for sure. Like, it's interesting. I feel like, so this is where, you know, I mentioned earlier in the podcast, like my background in school was anthropology. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I never thought about at the time, like how incredibly useful that background would be in, you know, dealing with branding and dealing with thinking about how people think and how they make decisions and why, you know, what drives them. And, you know, like, so the question about OTAs is really layered. Like there's the layer of, well, through capitalism and online shopping, we've all been trained to act certain ways at certain sites. So like you go to Amazon and you expect to be dealing with re retailers, but you go to yeah. Craigslist and you expect to be dealing with individuals and yeah. you go to eBay and you might be somewhere in between, but you go to Etsy and you know, it's going to be handcrafted independent goods. So, you know, right away, even before you shop for anything, no matter what you're looking for, you, we've all been trained already to kind of like think about how we want to navigate these landscapes. And right now I think the OTA really um, has no clear differentiators as to why one booking engine is better than another one because they all kind of are just an amalgam of the same things. They all search the same sites and they use the same metrics of like, what's the cheapest, what's the closest, all this kind of stuff. But we're in the business of trying to get people to care and, yeah. and, and take things from metrics that are not as easy to measure. Things that, again, like how does it feel? Uh, who's behind it? Like, do I like those people? Do they, do they support good things? Do, are, are they putting their money you know, into other good things and supporting their community? Am I supporting something that I feel good about in general? You know, like, so I feel like if there was an OTA that could be like the Etsy.com of that world that really had a strong point of view about what you're searching when you search there, you know, then, um, then you know, for example, if this focus was on independent hotels exclusively, well, the whole goal would be, well, anyone a part, a part of autograph collection might be independent, but they're easily findable. You know, like yeah. they don't need to be on this site. Yeah. So I think it's about making something that's a little bit more curated and a little bit more exclusive. Um, and then telling that audience, like, if you care about this stuff, come here, book yeah. through us, you know, and, and we're going to help you out and you're going to find the coolest hotels in the world. Um, so, you know, I think that there's been some natural training already. And I think we simply need to know what we're, as a society, what we're doing and what we're up against and then train, like work with what the momentum is like, cause Etsy already exists. So yeah. just think about like how it could work for OTAs. You know what I mean? Like that kind exactly. of stuff. Yeah. We even talked about but, like how, how weird, uh, you know, TripAdvisor is as far as like, it's like connects all these OTAs and is also an OTA and a ranking system. And like one that we often don't think about our rating system, I guess. Uh, and it's like one that we don't think about that often because we don't, book is often through TripAdvisor. Usually it's a more specific uh, process for us for work travel or for personal travel uh, mm -hmm. where we're like, oh yeah, I want to go check out that place, you know, but I think being in the, in, in the hotel world or hospitality world, you usually have a little bit more uh, knowledge of what's, what's in yeah. which location or how to find what you, what you yeah. like. Uh, so um, yeah, it's a, it's a, an interesting uh I don't know. I think a thing like that just people don't know or understand exactly how, how it works or what you get. You know, I think tablet did, did that for a long time pretty well. They were kind of talking about something entirely different than a lot of the other companies uh, or OTAs, I guess. Um, it's true. Uh, yeah, I was going to say they've grown to, to a point that it's, I don't know, not as, doesn't have a strong point of view as it used to. 
notes. What I was going to say with the, when it comes to like autograph collection, like that was the first property I ever worked at. And when our manager at the time was like, hey, I want you to start pushing for Marriott rule, you know, rewards people to sign up. You know, when you ask the guest who has no idea, and this will go to another point that I want to say too, but, um, you know, say, hey, are you a Marriott member with us? And then all of a sudden they look at you because you're independently owned and operated, but you have a Marriott standard, right? <laughs> right? So they look around, they're like, I didn't know this was a Marriott. What the heck? Yeah. And like, I'm, I'm a platinum member, or I'm a gold member or whatever. Um, and, and so th- there is that like, kind of like, Oh, we gotcha. Like, you know, type deal where mm-hmm. it's not, you know, misleading, but it is. And right. so the other thing I've always been preaching to like any of my staff members or any, just anybody that I have conversations with in the industry um, is that it's not our job to teach them about OTAs are bad and you need to book direct and like branding and all that stuff. Like it's not our job to educate them on the terms that we know. Like whenever you say an OTA to a person who's not in the industry, they're like, what's OTA mean? And then, so it's not our job to teach them. It's our job, like you were saying, Jeremy, uh, to create the experience, to create your story, your, you know, unique feeling so extremely well that when they do arrive and they do book, they are not confused at all. It's not our job to educate them. It's our job to communicate that properly and effectively through the booking system, the channel manager, the, you know, Facebook, the website, all this stuff. There's all these, you know, places, um, and, and and then of course, if they did go through an OTA, it's our job to then re- recognize that and win them over, win yeah. them over with that nostalgia, that feeling, that moment they walk in the lobby, they hear the music, they smell the coffee right down the hall. They, you know, all, all these things that happen, um, you know, using the senses because we're all humans. So at the end of the day, those are the things that are going to make us, of course, recognize and remember. So that's just kind of my two cents, but yeah, yeah totally agree. We, yeah, we talk a lot about engaging all the senses, you know, especially when we're working on interior design projects, we do we get that opportunity, you know, with the, and that's where like just branded brand projects, especially for hotels, you know, we came in to a lot of those late and they'd be like, oh, we need a brand, you know, and we'd come in and start asking a lot of questions and ask you, know, why did you make these decisions or how did you end up here and try to like then mash all this disparate thinking together to make it cohesive you know, and like we kept telling uh, clients that we were working with at the time, like, you know, you really should bring us in earlier to at least to like establish this foundation and let everybody work from from it in a different way and create it, interpret it, however it is. But if we all started from the same place and had the same goal, we'd probably end up with something a lot more understandable, you know? So uh, yeah, I, mean, I think, I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going with that. <laughs> well, I think you were just echoing what, what Will said. So. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, am I, am I, is there, I don't think I'm answering a question anymore. No, no, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but we, well, agree. Uh, we agree. Okay. Well, I want to ask and that, that go into from, I guess, your guys' experience and perspective is, again as well is, uh, so what's the, I guess, how important you is leveraging creative pricing options and the value of branding during like recession times or even times of COVID-19 where a lot of places are shut down and, and definitely not in the, uh, if they are open, they're accepting very minimal. And if they're, you know, soon to be open, you know, what can they expect? And, you know, leveraging creative, the pricing options and, and the way of communicating, you know, that stuff as well. I, I guess, uh, what's your, your thoughts on that? No, well, I had one, I had one place I'd love to start with that one, which is, I feel like, and you know, this, I think this might just be, um, happenstance or good luck rather than, than anything else. But like, I feel like the way that the decisions that Fritz and Evan and myself have been making as leaders and running OMF GECO over the past few years have positioned us really well to answer this question in a like post or pre COVID way and a post COVID way in the sense that we were already working remote two days a week, every week for the past year plus with our whole staff. So when all of a sudden everything went remote, it was really easy for our, for our group to, to, you know, transition to the remote work schedule. It's like, it's a bummer never seeing each, each other in person, but we can do yeah. it. No big deal. But also on top of that, you know, we already were doing interesting pricing options to your point. We were already interested in doing value-based pricing. We were already interested in, you know, basically we realized that a lot of our clients will come to us at their poorest point. They have zero money. You know, they have this great idea. They have this brand. They want to do something cool, but they can't pay us yet, at least not what we're worth. So what we realized is that like, if we could come up with some sort of like equity deals or revenue shares or um, any number of ways that we could tie 
our, our payment to their ultimate success. And so we're operating more like true partners, yeah. the more fluid the project could be to begin with. And, um, and then the more um, interesting our dynamic was with them too, because we, you know, we weren't opposing sides at all. We were more like partners working on solving the same problems together. And so, you know, post COVID, we're already doing these things. We're already working remotely. We're already doing interesting price structure stuff. And so we're just as flexible, just as amenable, but we're well-trained in doing so. So now when we're doing it, we have a more fine-tuned um, approach because we've been doing it with big brush strokes for so long now that um, you know, now we're starting to think like, um, you know, maybe this is a great time for us to reach back out to all of our contacts mm -hmm. in the hospitality space and talk to them about like, what do reopening plans look like and how can we yeah. help? You know, and yeah. so it's like not everyone's thinking like that because, you know, luckily, like we've positioned ourselves to do that kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah, I think it, honestly, yeah. it also it does seem like the perfect time to remodel a hotel for anybody out there who's listening. Uh, you know, you don't have to worry about too much noise for your guests. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, shutting down and not getting that uh, ADR you were going for. Uh, we're already there. Yeah, yep. your ADRs yeah. are already, already out the out the window. So yeah. might as well. Yeah, so, it's true. It's perfect. true. Call us. Uh, we're offering discounts to anyone who says Slick Talk in the uh, in the. Uh, uh, just email. let you guys know, I'm probably going to be your first client. So <laughs> after this, we're going to talk and. Uh, <laughs> perfect. So you, could you guys could you guys some equity in the show? Excellent, <laughs> excellent. But yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely any of interested uh, parties, please hit us up at our website, omfgco.com. Like we're definitely interested in helping. Awesome. Well, I guess this leads to the, you know, the final question and the thought. Um, what is your final um, words to the audience? Um, final, you know, just thoughts of the overall conversation. We covered a lot. Um, again, and I got really excited for this episode just because I think the importance, you know, of the transparency aspect of branding and communicating that experience and communicating, like we were talking about words that, you know, get so overplayed, like authentically bold and loud and all these certain things. Right. But I think, you know, transparency is, is the new, the new word that is probably going to get overplayed and overused, but in the, in the aspect is so important. And so, um, I just am curious, your final thoughts, your final words for the, the teams, the audience, anybody in the world that's listening regarding, you know, the upcoming events and life itself. Yeah, I mean, we, we wrote a Medium series a, a couple years ago now, and one, one, of the, one of the articles, I guess, in it is just kind of this, that idea of transparency and brand and how, how uh, tied those things are now, more tied than they used to be. You know, it's like... Uh, used to be able to say one thing and do another and you could get away with it and now you know uh there's just uh so much more accountability uh through social media and through you know yeah. all of these other ways that people can find out what you're actually doing so uh you know like the those things are just so so similar now that it's hard hard to separate them like it used to be you know like transparency is pretty much a requirement uh, you, you don't get a choice. And if you do, you only get the choice until someone finds out, which is, doesn't usually take that long anymore. And yeah. right. Jay, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I feel like it's one of those things kind of like, it's kind of like sustainability um, or even, even authenticity, you know, uh, like that, that term authenticity is just like, just because they get played out as terms doesn't mean that they're not valid anymore because they're, su they're super important. But I think what happens is, that they start to become table stakes. They start to become not special anymore. Like it's, it's expected. Like the brands that we really believe in are, of course they're green, of course they're recycling, of course, you know what I mean? Like they don't need to broadcast that necessarily unless it's like a very unique way of doing it. You know, like a very unique proprietary thing that no one else is doing and that they're really stoked on and that's cool. But you know, same with, same with being authentic. It's just like who will, being authentic is about being yourself. So it's like, it's yeah. about knowing yourself, knowing yourself as a brand. And so transparency is the same. I feel like, you know, as leaders, what we, we've learned that um, that's one of the best things we can do for our staff is just simply be as transparent as possible with like what's going on, what we're thinking about, why we're thinking about it, how we're solving for things, what we don't know, like all of it, you know, like just kind of let people know what we know. And um, I don't feel like there's ever going to be a bad time to be transparent or, or you know, that it's ever going to be a, you know, an overused term. I think it might be an abused term. I think that people might lean into it like as if it's special, but really I think it's going to be more table stakes. 
and it's going to be like it just needs to be there you know so, um, oh it's just new standard yeah, yeah yeah it feels it feels it feels responsible you know what yeah. i mean like honestly it feels like irresponsible to not give people the information they need because i mean all of us in the world not just america but all of us in the world are desperate mm -hmm. for some certainty right now during this yeah. pandemic Des desperate for yes. some some real numbers some real facts some things that don't yeah. completely get ca contradicted within the next 10 minutes because you know every everything is being contradicted back back and forth right now so i think that the the least we can do is give to others what we hope to get ourselves um and we so found that, uh, if you don't if you don't give that uh, people tend to fill it with whatever they think might be the case you know so it's like again just us sharing and uh, communicating more uh, with our team and with our clients, uh, it seems to always help. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think that's a great, great statement to end the show on. And I just want to, you know, thank you guys both so much for being transparent and authentic and being <laughs> OMFG. You know, I think, uh, you know, you guys just representing who you guys are as a company um, is, is huge. And, I'm just going to say this in, a, in an aspect of, you know, audience members. And I think a lot of people in the hospitality space can relate, you know, there's so many branding companies, there's so many media companies, there's so many things out there that, you know, say we, we, we do these things, but finding one that understands the industry like you guys do and being able to hop on a podcast and talk about these certain aspects that we talk about as providers already on a whole new different level is just is super unique and, and is totally I don't know. I think it's worth it's I don't know. I just I just want to say thank you. This is like super cool. Just an um, amazing time to be being able to provide I think just some value to anybody listening and and with of course like you said all the uncertainty going on this is a great way to be certain that we know that during this time it's time to work on some stuff, get it, you know, standardized and and to apply some some fundamentals to to reopen. So Thank you guys Thanks, so much man. for being on the show. Appreciate it, Will. Thanks so much for having us on. Yeah, it was Anytime. a lot of fun. Thank you so much for listening. We love your support and want to provide the best we can to all our listeners. So please find us online, social media, and on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Google Podcast. What's up, everybody? If you've gotten this far into the episode of Slick Talk, the Hospitality Podcast, then you are amazing, and thank you so much for tuning in. We want to send you two places really quickly. If you can, check out the show notes and click the hospitality.fm link. Check out all of our other shows on the podcast network. And don't forget, if you have someone that you want to hear on the podcast, then fill out the guest fill-out form so that way we can get them on the show. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy another episode of Slick Talk, the Hospitality Podcast. Podcast.